The material I'm planning to present here works equally well for any of these three integrals. So I'll just concentrate on the first one. You can try it out for the other two later if you wish. A and B here are intended to be constants. So we'll deal with this integral. The traditional way for dealing with such integrals is to use the sum and difference formally for angles inside a sine or a cos. I'm not going to do it in great detail. It's done elsewhere. I'll just remind you how the answer looks. We replace the integrand using those sum and difference formally as follows. A product of sine and cos has thereby been replaced by single sine functions. They're now easy to integrate. The only possible hitch is if a and b or a and negative b happen to be equal. In that case, this final answer would involve dividing by zero. We cannot permit that, so we have to go back to the original integral and choose either a or b and rewrite the integrand using a double angle formulae, like this. The integration can now be done again. I won't bother to do it. What I want to show you here, though, is that there can be more than one way to do an integral of this kind. In fact, this integral could be done using integration by parts instead. What's more, the answer, when we get it, will look rather different to the answer in the middle of the screen above. Let's see how this works. Here's the integral again. I'm going to integrate it by parts, making the choice that u is sine ax and dv by dx is cos bx. I'm not going to use the integration by parts formula though. I'm going to use the special tabular scheme that I think makes integration by parts a bit easier. There's plenty of maths casts recorded on that topic elsewhere. So what we have to do is take our choice of u, put it in a, the top of a left hand column and v primed in the top of a right hand column. The scheme then says that we take the left-hand entry, the sine ax, and persistently differentiate it, forming a column of derivatives beneath. We stop, usually, when the derivative gets to zero. However, that's not going to happen here because sine ax is not a polynomial. In hindsight, I remember that we've met situations like this when we do cyclic integration. So in fact, I'm going to stop after just two differentiations. On the right-hand side, we do the opposite thing. We persistently integrate. With those columns set up, we then alternate the sign in front of them, starting with plus. Next, I put some connections into the table. I've used the convention in the past that if I draw a red horizontal line, it represents an integral of the product of the things at each end of the line. So, for example, the integral we're trying to perform is represented by drawing a red horizontal line across the top from the sine ax to the cos bx. In anticipation of what's coming, I'm going to call that integral capital I. The process of integration by parts involves setting up diagonal lines, which I've in the past taken to be blue diagonal lines, from top left to bottom right across the table, like so. The blue diagonal lines represent terms in the answer on the right-hand side that consist of products of the functions at the end of each line. I take into account the signs at the front as well, the plus and the minus. With this particular integrand, we could go on integrating by parts forever and never get anywhere. So instead we have to choose a place to stop. But when we stop prematurely, that usually means that there's going to be an unintegrated term that is a surviving integral. In this case, it's the product of terms at the bottom of the table, which I'll now connect with a red line. That product of terms has to be written as a surviving integral on the right-hand side. Notice it has two minus signs and a coefficient a squared over b squared. So what I've now got is the result of doing two integrations by parts. But look, what about that last integral? It's nothing other than a multiple of the original integral i, isn't it? i was the integral of sine ax cos bx. So let's replace that integral with i. 
I'm going to do that by deleting the whole thing and just rewriting the I. And of course that's the standard way that cyclic integration works. We end up with a multiple of the old integral on the right hand side which we can then pass to the left hand side rearranging the equation and solving for I. So there's the next step. Before actually rearranging to solve for I I'm going to multiply both sides by B squared in order to avoid quotients underneath on the right hand side. So there are the factors of B squared and then I can expand brackets to get the following equation. And finally do the division. Once again the situation where A is equal to plus or minus B is anomalous and has to be treated differently. In fact the same way that we did before. However here integration by parts has given us a different view on this integral. It's still a correct answer but it looks a bit different to the original. I'd like to leave it as an exercise for you to reconcile these answers and show that in fact they are the same. You'll need to use the sum and difference formula for sine and cos. Here's a reminder of the original answer, the traditional way of doing the integral. If when doing that checking calculation you have difficulty reconciling the plus and minus signs then just be aware that you have to check whether it's a squared minus b squared or b squared minus a squared in the denominator. You might find that fixes things up. Finally as another exercise I suggest that you try to do the other two integrals at the top of this maths cast that I listed there by this new method. It's all good practice.